Greetings and welcome to the Cancer Interviews Podcast. I'm your host, Bruce Morton. Our guest on this episode needed three different types of treatment, but he's living proof that one can be diagnosed with stage three pancreatic cancer and survive and flourish. He is Nick Fafani of Delran, New Jersey. Not only has he survived pancreatic cancer, but these days he's doing a lot to help others who have been diagnosed. So now let's hear his story. Here he is. And Nick, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. It is our custom, Nick, at the very outset that we want to learn more about our guest exclusive of his or her cancer journey. So, Nick, if you would tell us a little bit about where you're from, what you do for work, and when time allows for fun, what you like to do. Yeah, sure, Bruce. So um, I live in Delran, New Jersey, and uh, I guess we've been, my wife and I have been in the area now for 16 years. And uh, currently today, I work for MasterCard. I've been uh, with the company for about eight years, and I run part of the merchant loyalty business uh, for MasterCard. And in my spare time, um, I love to run. Any excuse I get a chance to go out and run and train, I love to do that. And uh, you know, pretty much spending time with my family and going out and watching both my kids play sports. And your job, what's the best part of it? Oh, the best part of my job, honestly, um, I love working with our partners. Uh, our partners are just, it's fun to build. We, we build a lot of new products at work and to be able to build products with our customers, uh, that, that's probably the most fun. And we do have some people, I'm sure, listening or watching who run competitively. So if you would, uh, let us know, uh, some of your best running experiences, your best races? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I always have to go with uh, the, one of the first races I ever ran. Um, I ran uh, the Pittsburgh full marathon. And for any runners out there, I would definitely recommend the Pittsburgh race. Uh, it's a challenging course, but at the same time, uh, it's just uh, it's a beautiful course. You get a chance to run across three different bridges and, you know, I would say if you get an opportunity to run it, you should do that. And I would say the hardest race that I ever did was the uh, Ironman uh, 70.3 in Syracuse. Uh, I never really realized how many hills uh, were in Syracuse, uh, but I found that out when I, when I did my race. Well, I would say the same thing about Pittsburgh. A lot of people might not think of Pittsburgh and steep hills, but if you go to the north side part of Pittsburgh, plenty of hills. Yes, definitely the case. As I recall running across one of the bridges and hearing all the sighs, because as you were running across the bridge, you could see the massive hill that was awaiting you on the other side. So, Now, let's talk about your life before you were diagnosed. Based on what you're telling me, especially with your running prowess, running competitively, I would think that prior to your diagnosis, you were in pretty good health. Yeah, I was in, you know, probably near perfect health, right? Um, before, before diagnosis, wasn't on any medication, didn't need a pharmacy. Uh, generally, the question really was, is how many miles, you know, was I going to be running in that specific week or how many was I going to be swimming or biking? So for me, um, you know, life before my illness was probably pretty boring, right, uh, from a medical standpoint. But at some juncture, at some stage, you must have known that something wasn't quite right. What exactly was, uh, was not quite right? And uh, uh, how did that manifest itself? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's almost five years ago now, um, but it's still pretty vivid uh, for me. Um, it probably started in late January and early February where... I just noticed I started getting a lot of different GI distress. And um, when that started, you know, I just picked the phone up and I called my family doctor and said, you know, I don't think it's anything crazy, but, um, you know, I've been noticing these like GI issues over the last, you know, a couple of weeks. Could you, could you recommend, you know, a specialist that I could go see to just, you know, get, get looked at because I could tell something's a little bit off. Um, you know, but unfortunately, um, you know, when you want to find a good doctor, it takes a little bit of time. So, it, you know, I had to wait about four weeks and I didn't quite make it uh, to that point. 
but um, A had to get to B and B had to get to C. At some point, uh, what was going wrong led to a diagnosis. If you would take us through that chain of events. Sure. So, um, you know, I'd mentioned, right, I made an appointment to see a GI specialist, which I ended up <laughs> having to cancel because I ended up in the emergency room. And, uh, you know, what really led us there was every single time I ate, I was just in absolute distress. Um, I had lots of upper quadrant pain in my abdominal area. Um, you know, I, you know, plenty of GI issues and, you know, I, I, what started happening is, is I started eating less. I didn't quite catch on to it at first, but my fear of eating a meal because I knew what was kind of coming next. Um, what really kind of amplified it was, you know, I had a bout where uh, two nights in a row, I just had a, couldn't sleep um, because I had extreme back pain. Um, I was getting up in the middle of the night, getting in the shower to take a, a warm, hot shower to kind of like calm the pain down a bit so I could try to get, um, you know, go back to bed and try to sleep. Um, and then after one of those more, uh, one of those nights, I went out in the morning and tried to go for a run. And, um, you know, for me, I could run five miles in my sleep and I couldn't even make it down the hill and my, down my street where I had to stop and kind of turn around. And at that point, you know, I just knew that uh, something was, was seriously wrong. And what exactly led to the, what led to the diagnosis? Sure. Um, so after another night of, you know, sleepless night, basically uh, in a row, um, especially with all the back pain, you know, my wife and I kind of sat down that, you know, in the middle of the night and just decided, you know, she was going to go to work. She's a teacher. My kid, I would get my kids off to school and I would go to the ER. Um, so when I showed up at the ER and, you know, I was, you know, gave them my symptoms and checked in, um, they could tell I was in a lot of pain. And uh, they asked me many of the typical questions. And um, when they quickly understood I really wasn't there for the pain. I was there because I knew something was wrong and I, and I was looking to kind of get that figured out. So when they, they took me back, uh, they thought maybe it might be a gallbladder, right? So they did an ultrasound. And when they did the ultrasound, they said, okay, well, it's not a gallbladder. We're going to do a CT scan. Um, we think maybe it might be an early appendix. Uh, so they did the CT scan and then, um, when uh, I sat and waited for a little while, and then the doctor came in and turned the TV off. And when he turned the TV off, I knew something was really wrong um, because, uh, you know, one, I was watching it, and two, he obviously wanted my undivided attention. And, you know, that's when, you know, he had revealed at that time that I had, you know, a sizable mass on my pancreas that needed further study to determine exactly what was going on. Now, when you heard that news, did you think of uh, the possibility of a family history involved in this uh, could come into play? Um, well, at, at the time, I was unaware of anyone else in my family having any kind of a history. Um, I think where my mind went right away was, um, you know, I looked up the symptoms of pancreatic cancer and the signs. And I almost felt like I wrote them um, because the majority of them I was experiencing. Um, you know, what I would say is, um, you know, the next day, uh, my family doctor um, made sure I got a priority MRI um, that next day um, to help understand and get more study of that mass. And, you know, um, several hours later, they called me to confirm that it was indeed pancreatic cancer. And then that's when I really began kind of the journey around finding a medical team that would help, um, you know, help treat me. And then shortly later, I found out that my first cousin had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer just weeks before me. Now, for anybody who's been diagnosed with cancer, 
getting that terrible news is exactly that. It's, it, it's horrific, and it's uh, in a very sad way, a singular moment. But it sounds like in your case, Nick, in large part, you were prepared for this bad news. Yeah, I, you know, I, I have a history of cancer in my family. I watched my mom battle cancer for six years. Uh, my father is a two-time survivor of cancer. He's still alive. And, um, you know, being by myself, you know, I had a moment maybe to just kind of collect my thoughts. Um, but, you know, I have a wife and I've got two kids that need me. And, uh, you know, I would just say it's a runner's mentality in my mind around Let's prepare ourselves um, for what we need to do and let's get ready and uh, kind of meet it head on. It's interesting you bring up the running component because years ago I had a chance to have a private audience with, uh, with a big name in distance running, although from a, a long ago era, Marty LaCorey. And Marty LaCorey said, as uh, we were talking about finishing a race, the last 400 meters, the last 200 meters, he said, in that stage of the race, you need to have the heart of a predator. It almost sounds, Nick, like, like you took on cancer with the heart of a predator, like uh, this is my opponent and I'm going to beat it. Yeah, I would, definitely, I would definitely say that. I mean, one of my all-time idols is Steve Prefontaine, and he would talk about the difference between you know, um, him and many of his competitors. And he used to say that, um, you know, they couldn't beat him because they didn't have the guts to endure the pain to get through the race, right, and do what it takes to win. And, um, you know, I will definitely say being a runner, being able to compartmentalize and break down things and uh, I think certainly helped me. And, you know, my goal was to take on my diagnosis head on and, uh, it really was to win. That's what I told my kids. I said, I don't have any intention on losing. I have an intention on winning. Um, you know, and I was very honest with them. And I told them, that, you know, if things would change, I would let you know. I said, but um, my plan is I'm not going anywhere. By the way, if you like what you hear on this segment, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast by clicking the links below. Once there, you will see a bell icon. If you click on that, we will notify you when we post a new interview. Now, Nick, let's, let's get to the next step in this journey, uh, the treatment phase. What was the first thing you encountered in the treatment phase? Sure. So what I quickly learned was that my, my cancer was inoperable because the cancer was surrounding the um, superior mesenteric artery and vein. So surgery was not an option um, from the get-go. So I began my journey with chemotherapy. I had full Firinox um, to get started, which was uh, a very aggressive chemotherapy. And, and how uh, difficult was that? How difficult was that? Because nobody who undergoes chemotherapy, they might be glad they underwent it when, when all is said and done. But when they're going through chemotherapy, it's never pleasant. It's never fun. How difficult was that for you, especially this aggressive form of treatment? It was probably the most difficult thing I've ever gone through, uh, to be very honest. Um, you know, I don't claim to be Superman, um, although at times, you know, um, you know, I maybe felt like Superman because I could run and I could train really quick. But I would give you the analogy that when I had chemotherapy, I felt like Clark Kent. Um, I felt like, um, you know, I was I was lethargic and I was really um, kind of beat up from treatment, probably on average for about five days after, you know, from the point of starting treatment um, to the end of that specific cycle. So it was, it was really aggressive. I had to learn how to cope with it. I learned, I, ne I needed to learn how to rest and sleep. And then when I started feeling better, I would go out and I would run or I would get on the bike um, and try to get as, you know, keep as physically fit and active as I could throughout my journey. And what was food consumption like? Because many times we hear that, that eating becomes unpleasant because food can taste like metal. Yeah, that is definitely true. I remember the metallic tastes. And, um, you know, if you drank something cold during the chemo, it was almost like it was glass in your throat. So, 
it was a little bit of a learning experience. Um, my rule of thumb was just whatever tasted good for me at the time was kind of what I ate. So I had a phase where I just wanted pizza. Um, so frankly, that's what I ate many days. Um, so I just really tried to figure out what worked well for me and I went with it. And by trial and error, I just eliminated the things that just didn't uh, perhaps agree with me. Okay, well, that addresses your palate, but what about your mind? We hear all the time this term chemo brain from people who have gone through chemotherapy. Did that affect you? And if so, to what extent? Yeah, I would definitely say I, I, I definitely recall like a little bit of fogginess in the brain. And sometimes I felt like I had to write things down a little bit more. For me, I, I tried to run almost every day. And even if it was slower, it didn't matter because for me, it was just a matter of getting my run in and I wasn't letting cancer get in its way. And to be honest, running for me became a stimulant for my brain. It also became a reason to know that maybe it took me a little bit longer. I had to go a little bit slower, but I made it and I finished and I wasn't going to let it beat me that day. And I honestly think it built um, you know, my morale up. It kept me mentally strong and it helped keep me focused. Now, chemotherapy was not the only treatment that you underwent during your journey. What happened after chemotherapy? Sure. So after about six sessions of the chemotherapy, the doctors noticed, obviously, that my body just wasn't responding. My body was taking a toll. Uh, the, the chemo took a toll on me. Um, so they changed me over to radiation uh, for five and a half weeks. And I had a, a chemo drip one day, you know, each during that week. And uh, for me, you know, the radiation was targeted um, to, sp to the specific areas of where my tumors were at. And it was just a couple minutes each day, five days a week. And with that, I have to say, I did much better. Um, you know, I would go to radiation treatment and I would, at six o'clock in the morning, I'd come home and I'd put my shoes on and I'd go out and run. And then, you know, even during that time, I did so well where I went back to work um, during radiation because I, I didn't feel the same effects uh, that I had during chemotherapy. Yes, I was still a little bit fatigued and tired. Maybe my stomach was a little queasy at times, but um, I, was, I was really looking to just... Um, you know, try to keep a semblance of, of, of my life being somewhat normal, right? And keeping myself busy. Now, it sounds like uh, you were able to run during chemo and you were able to run during radiation, but uh, what was eating like? Um, you know, what I found was there were certain foods that I just couldn't eat anymore. Um, so I really started eliminating meat from my diet because anytime I found that uh, I was eating meat products, it just caused a lot of stomach distress. Um, so fortunately for myself, seafood uh, was a really good option for me. And uh, I just happened to love seafood. So, you know, I quickly kind of changed my diet um, to, you know, try to keep my stomach um, feeling good and, and keeping my body feeling good. Now, the radiation, it sounds like the radiation helped, but it was not the final step in your journey. What happened after radiation? So after radiation concluded, I had a new CT scan done, and uh, I took those results uh, to the original surgeon that I met with at the point that I was diagnosed. And uh, he reviewed the scans and the pictures, and he told me that the, you know, the treatment was quite effective. Um, that he believed that the uh, tumor moved enough away from the artery and vein to attempt surgery. Um, so we had to wait about an additional 30 days just to make sure all the treatment and everything had left my body before um, they would attempt uh, a Whipple procedure. Now, for somebody who has learned that they could be a candidate for pancreatic cancer or for somebody who's just being diagnosed, Tell us a little bit more about the Whipple procedure, what it entails. 
Yeah, sure. So the there's different forms of the Whipple procedure, um, but the one that I had was it was the pylorus preserving uh, Whipple procedure. They didn't touch my stomach. They essentially moved um, since the the tumor was in uh, the head of my pancreas. They removed uh, about a third of my pancreas, so the head of my pancreas. And then they also um, removed uh, my gallbladder as well as uh, the jejunum, which kind of connects everything to your pancreas, to your small intestines. So they basically took those pieces out and then they replumbed me back together. And why they did that, um, I also had a clinical trial where they were, when they were in there, they did a saline wash inside in case there were any kind of microscopic um, types of cancer particles in there. So, um, you know, they, they did that along the way. So at this point, once the Whipple procedure was done, how did you feel with no gallbladder or uh, anything else that was removed? Well, I have to say when I first woke up, I went in for surgery. The last thing I remember, it was, you know, you know, around 7 a.m., and when I remember opening my eyes and I was in the ICU in my room, it was about seven o'clock. So when I woke up, I had a fear that they kind of opened me up and they couldn't do it. I didn't realize that uh, it had been 12 hours later and I was just waking up and my procedure was done. So I would say, you know, at first I was a little nervous and uh, then you know, we were kind of waiting for all the results. But when I first woke up, you know, I was, you know, obviously well medicated during that time. And I was relatively relaxed. Um, when I woke up the next morning, um, I, they got me quickly out of bed. And uh, I was definitely hurting, um, you know, for the next couple of days. But, you know, once I had the surgery, it was almost like I had to teach myself how to eat again. Um, because you're, you have to eat in very small meals and break things down. You have to be very careful about it's about eating more frequent meals and smaller meals. So it really did take a lot of patience in the beginning around, uh, around doing that. You know, I had learned that my, you know, surgery was quite successful. Uh, so for me, you know, I just looked at maybe some of the differences as a minor inconvenience because, uh, you know, the story and the script had changed for me. Our guest is Nick Pifani of Delran, New Jersey. He has survived stage three pancreatic cancer. And Nick, I, I, I now want you to channel a bit of your uh, running prowess into this story. At some point right around this juncture, I'm thinking that uh, perhaps that you're thinking that uh, you're getting the upper hand on this. Is that fair to say? Oh, definitely so. I, I would say at that point, I probably saw the finish line tape and I knew I was coming through it first. Um, you know, I honestly felt that when I met my surgeon for the second time and he told me I was going to be a candidate for surgery, to me, that's where the game really changed. Um, I felt like, wow, I went, you know, from six months prior to being, you know, inoperable to now to a point of being operable. And when I came out of the surgery, you know, I, the next day I made my, I, I told them, take me to physical therapy. I want to pass physical therapy so I could walk as much as possible because my surgeon said, you got to walk, you got to keep moving. It's going to help recovery. And, uh, you know, I was counting the, the days, but for me, I think that's when all my family, um, all my friends everywhere, um, you know, they, I would say they were, they were just rallying in my corner extra loud because, they knew the tide was changing and they could tell uh, that uh, things were looking up for me. Now, you had mentioned uh, family and friends when the, uh, the cancer journey is, you know, getting kind of over the hill in a, in a good sort of way. But what about when things were tough? Uh, what, was, what were your family and friends like by way of support? Well, I, I would say that um, they were incredible. Um, 
probably a day didn't go by where I didn't get phone calls, texts, or cards in the mail um, from from family and friends. Um, I would say in the beginning, I was probably the one to stop them from crying and telling him it was going to be okay. Um, but that's all right too, because, you know, they, they care about you and they know it was, it was a tough diagnosis. Um, you know, so they were there for me and, and, and honestly, you know, I think they were just so thrilled and happy to hear that surgery was going to be an option because they know they knew for me surgery meant the possibility of actually going in remission and um you know i would say that uh they were just probably beyond words right they couldn't they couldn't capture how excited um you know they were for not only me but for you know for my wife and my kids so you've gotten to the point now of survivorship just how did that feel to know that you had been hit with this very formidable opponent and you had gotten the best of it? What was that like? I'm still probably trying to grasp <laughs> that, to be honest, uh, Bruce. Um, you know, it was, you get the worst, one of the worst types of cancers and the worst kind of it. And um, it was, and it is, it, it's, a, it's a scary thing. Um, but I would say for me, it's probably a little bit bittersweet, um, because, you know, the, the five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is just 10%. And I get a reminder of that all the time. Um, you know, because I lost a cousin, one cousin, uh, the cousin who I found out in the beginning to pancreatic cancer, uh, we found out another a cousin that had passed away a few years prior to that had pretty much the same symptoms. So we were pretty sure that she had the same thing. And then we lost my uncle about a year, a year later after me. Um, so I really do understand how lucky I am um, because today, unfortunately, the way the numbers stack up, um, my outcome is not typical. Um, so, you know, we don't take that for granted. Um, you know, we celebrate, um, you know, my, the day I got my Whipple basically as, um, you know, almost like your second birthday, um, because, you know, that's the day that things change for me, uh, traumatically for me. So is there anything you and your wife do to celebrate this very important milestone? Uh, well, a lot of times my wife will decorate my door. <laughs> you know, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll, I'll go downstairs and I'll see my office door is decorated. Um, you know, we look at the purple stride event, um, that Pancan has as, as a celebrate, as, as a celebration event as well. Um, we stride in the, the Philadelphia purple stride every year. Um, so we do, we do that together. Um, you know, I would just say that in general, not a day goes by. We don't need a calendar to remind any of us what day I was diagnosed, you know, what day I had my Whipple surgery. And, you know, we know all those things. I think, honestly, Bruce, we, we don't take the little things for granted anymore. Now, let's talk about uh, the organization you briefly referenced, PanCan. How did you find out about PanCan? What does it do for you? And uh, how do you give back? Yeah, well, it's so interesting because I stumbled upon PanCan by accident. Um, when I first got diagnosed, you know, the, the numbers didn't look too good. Um, and, you know, some folks were telling me, well, you probably only have about six months or nine months. And I was looking for a 5K to run, and I, I stumbled upon the Purple Stride event. And I thought to myself, well, I'll show them. I'm going to register for this 5K event, and I'm going to show up in November, and I'm probably going to win it. So, um, you know, I'll be there to kind of, um, you know, sh tell them I told you so. And ironically, um, when I signed up, I started, you know, uh, putting uh, my fundraising efforts out on, on Facebook, and I went into my first chemotherapy session. And I don't remember a whole lot after my first one because it really hit me hard. 
But I came home, and about four days later, um, I got a, an email from one of my first bosses, and he said, hey, Nick, you better increase your fundraising goal because you already beat it. Um, you know, so I'd looked at it and in the amount of a handful of days, we raised $10,000, um, you know, for PanCan. So I got, had gotten some phone calls, um, from some of the folks, um, you know, uh, at PanCan National, the Philadelphia affiliate actually surprised me my first day of, 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 um, chemotherapy. They had a kind of a care bag for me. And they delivered it and, you know, the nurses brought it to me. And, and honestly, that's kind of how we got introduced. And um, ever since, you know, I've been, uh, I feel like they're part of my second family. I, um, I hold uh, the sponsorship chair position at, at, for the Philadelphia affiliate, um, you know, is, which is a way of giving back. I'm a co-chair of the Survivor Council um, at, at PanCan. And frankly, you know, um, the one thing I wish I would have known is I wish I would have known about PanCan earlier, um, you know, earlier in the journey, because it probably would have really, um, you know, helped me from an education standpoint and maybe help connect me a little bit more from, you know, some of the things I had to do on my own in the beginning. Now, you mentioned the education piece with PanCan. For the person who has learned that they may be a candidate for pancreatic cancer or somebody who's been freshly diagnosed, what are some of the other things PanCan can do for them? I think that the, the top thing is um, they offer um, patient services and they're free. Um, they could call in to a free 1-800 number and they can you know, tell that person a little bit about themselves and what their journey is. They get a case manager assigned to them. And, and they can also not only help um, the person that's going through cancer, um, they could also help any of the caregivers along the way. Um, they can help them navigate, understand what clinical trials might be available, what doctors or specialists may be available in their area. And honestly, that's, that's really a key component because many folks who get diagnosed, sometimes they struggle. They don't know where to start. And patient services can be that bridge for them to help them get connected to the right person right away because pancreatic cancer is not something that you have a lot of time with. You need to get on top of your treatment uh, plan in, in a smart way right from the beginning. Now, if somebody falls into this profile we just mentioned, someone who could be a candidate for pancreatic cancer or somebody who's been diagnosed or someone who was a loved one of either of these two categories, how can they access PanCan, a web address? Sure, they would go to pancan.org. And that's P-A-N-C-A-N.org. That's correct. All right, uh, Nick, we're going to wrap things up now. And whereas we always start the interview from the same place, we always like to end it from the same place. And that is, if you encountered somebody and you had a private audience with someone who fits into one of those categories I just mentioned, a candidate or somebody who's just been diagnosed, if there was a message that you had for that person, if there's one overarching point that you wanted to make sure you drove home, what would it be? Well, I would say, I would say know your body and understand the symptoms. You know, I, 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 I look back at things and I sometimes wonder, did I know perhaps something was happen, happening a little bit earlier? And, um, I, I think, you know, now that I've had time to reflect on that, understanding and knowing what the symptoms are and then knowing what is not typical for yourself, I think is, is a key, key indicator there. I was fortunate enough that I was not diagnosed at stage four. Um, so being, diagnosed at stage three, at least was a little bit earlier for me, really gave me an opportunity to kind of get that upper hand. Okay. A tremendous story from you, Nick, one that, uh, one that had a happy ending and, and it, it's one that, uh, uh, that continues to be a happy story. You can still run, you can still run hard and, uh, looks like you have your appetite back 
and uh, just a, a, a great story and a lot of information. And again, that uh, web address we wanted to mention for PanCan, one more time, it's PanCan, P-A-N-C-A-N dot org. Nick, thanks very much for being with us. Really appreciate the time. Thanks so much, Bruce. It was a real pleasure. And that's going to wrap up this episode of Cancer Interviews. We hope what you heard can aid the cancer journey for you or a loved one. So until next time, we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.